Hello, a very warm welcome to all of you from Sultan Singh, a student of the Integrated Program of Management course at IIM Indore. I will be moderating this session. Today is the second and final day of a very special session of Sustainable Development E Talk SDG Talks series, which was co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management Indore. This series was launched on World Health Day on 7th April 2020 and over a period of 2 months it featured 30 online sessions with more than 80 thought leaders from 15 countries globally who shared their insights on a range of issues related to sustainable development third year students of integrated program of management IPM course at IIM Indore who had interned with CNS actively participated in these talks but now they are on the other side of the fence today 19 of these students will be the speakers and they will present their thoughts on sustainable development 17 students had shared their insights yesterday a warm welcome to all our speakers i am also honored to welcome our two chairs for the session we are indeed privileged to have with us ms nenet ortega and professor dr ramakant to chair the session nenet ortega is country manager of the aids healthcare foundation in the philippines working through partnerships with local ngos and the government to push for cutting edge medicine and advocacy regardless of their ability to pay she has over 30 years of experience of working in the health and development sector working with different communities in collaboration with the local government she mobilizes private practicing providers to respond to maternal child and newborn health family planning and reproductive health and integrating hiv stis at the primary health level a second chair for today is dr rama khan who is the former professor and head of department of surgery at king's george king george medical university and honorary dean college of surgeons of india he is also the recipient of world health organization director general's award for tobacco control and is internationally known for his fight against tobacco use a very warm a very happy doctors day to you sir and to all of us because we cannot imagine a world without com competent doctors a very warm welcome to all a chair persons a few house quick housekeeping announcements participants please mute yourself while the speakers present the session is also being streamed live on the facebook page of cns there will be a q and a session at the end of the presentations those who are using the zoom platform can type in their comments and ask in the chat box even as the speakers present or you can ask your question after raising your virtual hand once all speakers have presented if you are watching it on facebook live you can type your questions in the comment box in the interest of time please keep your questions and comments brief and precise also we are living in difficult times and most of us are working from home so please bear with us in case of any technical glitches arising out of poor connect internet connectivity issues today's first presentation is by nishan makkar abhimanyu thakur utkarsh tiwari ojasvi ganesh and shivam kumar on the topic tobacco a social evil Am I audible to everyone? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Sir Taj, for that lovely introduction. I will take it from here. First of all, I would like to give a special mention to Shobha Ma'am, Bobby Sir, and the entire CNS team for giving us the opportunity to speak at this event. I would like to thank all the audience members for joining us to, for today's event. So the issue in contention today is a major problem plaguing Indian society. rampant tobacco consumption tobacco consumption adversely affects our physical mental and emotional health and is one of the leading causes of a host of ailments including cancer diabetes and coronary heart disease yet due to its addictive properties tobacco consumption is still rampant across the country ministry of health reported that 28.6% of the population consumes tobacco which is close to 30 crore people we want to address this issue specifically because majority of the tobacco users start consuming the drug between the ages of 18 to 
and majority of our audience members today fall in that age group so if you are a tobacco user this might be an eye opening for eye opener for you so let's begin first i would like to invite mr ojaswi ganesh to the stage mr ojaswi my question to you is what compels people to start using tobacco uh, thank you nishan before starting with the reasons i would like to state 2014 surgeon general's report which states that nearly 9 out of 10 adults smokers started before age 18 and nearly all started by age 26 the report estimates that about 3 out of 4 high school school smokers will become adult smokers even if they intend to quit in a few years uh, so here are the main reasons that influ- influence people which are especially teens to smoke the first reason is the desire to look cool by far the biggest reason people start smoking is the desire to look cool to a 14 to 16 year old kid without much life experience smoking a cigarette feels like a cool mature thing to do this is especially true if most of the adult in his or her life smoke cigarettes and have for the most of their lives Teen- teenagers are still creatures of imitations and if they perceive cigarette as the adult thing to do they are most likely to do it the second important reason is peer pressure another reason people start smoking is peer pressure while everyone responds to peer pressure differently most kids are susceptible to its influence which are which they are in their early teens this is when they care more about the opinions of the friends than nothing else and will do almost anything to st- stay in their friends good graces sadly this can lead to things even worse than cigarette smoking such as vandalism or hardcore drug abuse third is the media influence media can exert a significant influence over on a viewer's decision making one has to look how hairstyle or clothing fashion can be launched by single movie or tv episode to see the extent of the power to see the extent of this power in many parts of the world smoking in the media can have same influence as fashion or appearance of trendy trendy gadgets in actors hand studies have suggested that when young viewers see a main character smoking they are more likely to see smoking as something socially acceptable stylish and desirable for another reason is that poor coping skills some people begin smoking to numb their stress which cigarettes are quite good at doing in the short term a teenager or adult with poorly developed coping skills who has not proper strategies for solving life problems and dealing with stress is more apt to start smoking than someone who has learned such strategy unfortunately such people often don't know any any better and are just trying to feel better hence they resort to smoking cigarette the last reason which i feel is uh, is important is that the social habit habit which leads to addiction some people begin smoking socially at parties with no intention of becoming addicted they may have started only by smoking cigarettes that addicted smokers offer to them in social situation justifying with statements like well as long as i am not buying on my own and smoking all time it's okay to do once in a while while some people can pull this off others cannot and for them social smoking is just a grease shoot to full blown addiction okay thank you just we thank you for your insights so uh, what i gather is that societal elements are the most common factors driving people to smoke this is actually very unfortunate it surely gives us all some food for thought okay so now moving on now i would like to invite uh, mr abhimanyu thakur to the stage abhimanyu my question to you is would you suggest that switching to alternatives of tobacco to other intoxicants such as hookah cannabis or alcohol would be better from a health perspective yeah uh, that's a very commonly asked question am i audible to everyone hello yes you yes you yes, are abhimanyu audible. Audible. Yeah. So the thing is that every year hundreds of marijuana, alcohol, cigarette and hookah addicts visit rehab centers to get back to their normal lifestyle. But what we need to understand uh, right now is that none of the above mentioned which are marijuana, alcohol, cigarette and hookah are good for health, but rather what affects the body the least. 
Now you see alcohol consumption in higher quantity has damaging effects on the liver and kidney. It reduces the oxygen intake capacity of the blood, which can affect the heart and brain in the long run. The smoke of cigarette is dangerous to lung and heart primarily, but later it affects the entire body, including the liver, blood, eyes, limbs, and the brain. Now, most of the damages caused by the cigarette smoke is irreversible if not treated in time. Now, marijuana forms carbon monoxide and tar on burning. It also requires intense inhalation to feel the effects. It also affects the lung and uh, heart as well. Now, in the long run, it can damage several body organs, which are also irreversible, uh, as in the case of smoke uh, of the cigarette. However, marijuana helps cure the cancer cell in the human body, which makes people argue about its safety. Uh, marijuana is also legal in many other countries and many states of the United States as well. Now, hookah is considered to be the most dangerous of all as it does not have any filtration process to filter the tar produced by the tobacco, which only makes the smoke denser with the help of water. Now, in the end, any sort of intake, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, cigarette, or hookah, is worst. These items were once created for healthcare purposes in the past, but now people started to take these in excessive amount, which led, which as a result, uh, led to be, you know, into a bad addiction. Over to you, Nishan. Okay. Thank you, Abhimanyu. That was quite an eye-opener. All these intoxicants are bad for us. The best thing to do is to switch to cleaner alternatives. Uh, but, uh, Nishan, I would like to know more about the harmful effects that cigarettes, cigarette brings with them. Okay, that's a good question, Ujasi. Thank you for your question. So, uh, consuming tobacco has an adverse impact on one's physical, mental, and emotional health. I will go one by one on how it impacts different organ systems of our body. Now, smoking tobacco can cause exposure to a lethal mixture of more than 7,000 toxic chemicals, in, including at least 70 known carcinogens that can damage nearly every organ system in the human body. This causes a smoker to typically lose a decade of life. Now, first, let me come to the central nervous system. Now, one of the ingredients in tobacco is a mood altering drug called nicotine. Nicotine alters the body's ability to regulate dopamine, the brain's happy hormone. Now, this can produce anxiety and tension. This also makes smokers vulnerable to develop severe mental health problems in the future. Also, nicotine is extremely addictive, which is why people find it difficult to quit tobacco. Um, next, moving on to the respiratory system. So when you inhale smoke, you're taking, taking in substances that can damage your lungs. Now, Smoking anything is unnatural and can damage your lungs. You smoke uh, hookah, you smoke cannabis, or you smoke tobacco, makes no difference. So uh, this can lead to a variety of problems, including many chronic non-reversible lung conditions in the future. These include bronchitis, pulmonary disease, and even lung cancer. Um, now moving on to next, uh, the integumentary system, which is the skin, hair, and nails. The more obvious signs of smoking involve skin changes. Now, uh, substances in tobacco can actually change the structure of your skin and increase the risk of skin cancer. Even your fingernails and toenails are not immune to the effects of smoking. Uh, smoking increases the likelihood of fungal nail infection. Um, hair is also affected by tobacco. A study by University of Massachusetts found that it increases hair loss, balding, and graying. Um, now moving on to the uh, reproductive system. Nicotine affects the blood flow to the genital areas of both men and women. For men, this can decrease sexual performance and cause erectile dysfunction. For women, this can result in sexual dissatisfaction by decreasing lubrication and the ability to reach orgasm. Smoking also lowers the sex hormone levels in both men and women. 
Um, so now to summarize uh, these ill effects, I would like to share an infographic with you all. So uh, I'll just share my screen. Yes. Okay. So is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So uh, in this infographic, you can all see um, the risks you take by smoking just one cigarette. So um, I would suggest all the audience members to take a screenshot of this so that next time you get the urge to consume tobacco or someone uh, gives you a tempting offer to smoke or chew tobacco, you can remember this infographic and uh, see the list of uh, diseases you are risking to your body. Um, this would help you uh, to resist those temptations to smoke or chew tobacco. So uh, I will not sh stop sharing my screen. So um, now moving on, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Shivam Kumar to the stage. Uh, Mr. Shivam, why do people find it hard to quit tobacco? Can Thank you, you Nitha. elaborate on that? Yeah. So as you mentioned, tobacco contains over 5,000 chemicals, including nicotine. Nicotine is highly addictive and smokers develop a physical dependence to their use of tobacco. Once people start smoking, it's hard to stop because nicotine is extremely addictive. Nicotine is considered to be as addictive as heroin and cocaine. Uh, it is believed that uh, there is a three-link chain uh, of physical, so social, and mental components to smoking addiction. The physical aspect uh, so when nicotine is in inhaled, uh, it causes the release of another ke uh, chemical called dopamine in the brain that makes you feel good. Unfortunately, after the dopamine wears off, uh, these symptoms return, which causes the smoker to crave another cigarette. Smokers also build up a tolerance and physical dependence on nicotine, meaning they have to smoke more to feel the sa same effect. And when your body does not get nicotine, you may feel uncomfortable and crave more cigarettes. The mental aspect, uh, the act of smoking is often a uh, part of a daily routine for almost every uh, smoker. Uh, they tend to light up uh, at specific, specific times of day uh, when drinking coffee or driving or when they are feeling a certain way like stressed or tired. Uh, cigarettes can become a crutch almost like a steady friend to, uh, you can rely on. Uh, the social aspect. Uh, many smokers develop social groups around smoking. People will head out for a small uh, smoke break with friends or, or co-workers. Uh, smoking can also be used as a social icebreaker by saying, uh, got a lighter. Um, stopping or cutting back uh, on tobacco causes symptoms of uh, nicotine withdrawal. Uh, withdrawal is both physical and mental. Uh, uh, physically, your body is reacting to the absence of nicotine. Mentally, you are faced with giving up a habit which calls for a major change in behavior. Emotionally, you might feel as if, as if you, uh, you have lost your best friend. Uh, some of nicotine withdrawal symptoms can include uh, dizziness, depression, feelings of frustration, anxiety, irritation, trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating, headaches, tiredness, weight gain, slower heart rate, and a uh, few generic uh, issues like cough, dry mouth, sore throat, uh, nasal drip and also chest tightness. These symptoms can lead a person to start using tobacco again to boost blood levels of nicotine and stop uh, symptoms. One might uh, say that it can't be that hard uh, to quit smoking. You just need to have the willpower and stay away from fears to smoke. Uh, this is also believed to be the best way to quit smoking. That is to do so without any support, also known as going cold turkey but only 4 to 7% of people who attempt to quit smoking are able to do it. Many ex-smokers say that quitting smoking was the hardest thing they have ever done. This includes people who have climbed mountains and corporate ladders or tackled childbirth. It can take a smoker multiple smoking attempts, uh, attempts before uh, multiple, multiple quit smoking attempts before uh, they are completely smoke free. If you are seeking motivation to help you in your quit, know that you are not alone. Quitting can be hard because smoking is just more than a habit. Uh, it's an addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Shivam. That was really informative and insightful. It seems like you get trapped in a vicious cycle. Again, it seems like uh, 
the factors holding you back from quitting are a mix of biological and social factors so the next question comes what strategies can we employ to quit smoking for that i would like to in, invite final speaker for the talk mr utkarsh tiwari uh, utkarsh can you please elaborate on this yes utkarsh uh, i there i know actually his mic is muted utkarsh please unmute yourself utkarsh unmute yourself utkarsh please unmute yourself okay now am i audible yes yes yes, yes. you are audible i'm oh, really sorry so as shivam has already mentioned quitting smoking is extremely difficult even though we all know the health risk of smoking but that doesn't make it easier to kick the habit whether you are an occasional teen smoker or a lifetime pack a day smoker quitting can be really tough while some smokers successfully quit by going cold turkey most people better with a tailored plan to keep themselves on track so i would suggest a strategy to stop smoking which is a start plan s t a r t s stands for set a quit date choose a date within the next 2 weeks so that you have enough time to prepare without losing your motivation to quit t stands for tell family friends and coworkers that you plan to quit a stands for anticipate and plan your, for the challenges you will face while quitting most people who begin smoking again do so within the first 3 months you can help yourself make it through by preparing ahead for common challenges such as nicotine withdrawals and cigarette craving r stands for remove cigarettes and other tobacco products from your home car and work t stands for talk to your doctor about getting help to quit your doctor can prescribe medications to help you with withdrawal symptoms if you can't see a doctor you can get some other products such as over the counter at your local pharmacy including nicotine patches and gum identify your smoking triggers one of the best things you can do is to help yourself quit is to identify the things that make you want to smoke first of the tips is to avoid the smoking triggers is alcohol many people smoke when they drink try switching to non alcoholic drinks or drink only in places where smoking inside is prohibited also other smokers when family friends and coworkers smoke around you it can be doubly difficult to give give up or avoid relapse talk about your decisions to quit so people know you they won't be able to smoke when you are in the car or with them taking a coffee break together manage cigarette craving distract yourself remind yourself why you quit focus on the reasons for quitting get out of the tempting situations reward yourself reinforce victories medication and therapy to help you quit nrt is the most famous as we all know nicotine replacement therapy nicotine replacement therapy involves replacing cigarettes with other nicotine substitutes such as nicotine gum patch inhaler or nasal spray it relieves some of the withdrawal symptoms by delivering small and steady doses of nicotine into your body without the tar and poisonous gases found in cigarettes non nicotine medications these medications help you stop smoking by reducing craving and withdrawal symptoms without the use of nicotine what to do if you slip or relapse that's the most important thing most of the smokers try to quit but they relapse and end up quitting on quitting you are not a failure if you slip up it doesn't mean you can't quit for good don't let a slip become a mud slide throughout the rest of the pack it is important to get back on the non smoking track as soon as possible look back at your quit log and feel good about the times when you went without smoking find the trigger exactly what was it that made you smoke again decide how will you cope with the issue the next time it comes up learn from your experiences what has been the most helpful that and what didn't work and last but not least are you using a medicine medicine to help you quit call your doctor if you start smoking again that's all i have to say thank you for your advice utkarsh that was really useful so now to conclude we learned today that tobacco consumption is bad for your health we went through the reasons why people start consuming tobacco why they find it hard to quit and uh, we laid out some strategies to quit tobacco 
if you have any questions about the presentation uh, you can type them in the chat box below and we will take them up in the q and a session thank you uh, thank you very thank much you. yeah thank you very much to this group and i really liked your slogan stop smoking before smoke stops you uh, and also your innovative way of presentation and isn't it a coincidence that we have with us today doc, dr professor ramakant who's actually a combination of all those four speakers who presented their views and it is a mere happy coincidence so uh, and you have rightly mentioned tobacco industries focus on drawing the youth in their net and they are touting new products every day like i cos i quit ordinary smoking and e cigarettes and all that so uh, dr ramakant would you like to please comment on this from your personal experience and dr ramakant has been uh, very very forthcoming in starting uh, quit smoking clinics in lucknow he was the first one to start a quit smoking clinic so over to you dr ramakant for your brief comments yes good evening friends thank you very much madam uh, as you said it has been one of my passion uh, to uh, deal with the tobacco that which are besides my surgical you know uh, profession the, i was listening to all, to all of you and uh, i heard that uh, most of the subji contents were quite correct uh, one point i would like to uh, uh, definitely point out to you and that is that uh, you should not take anything uh, suppose somebody is failing you not able to you know control the, his habit or addiction then he should not go to the otc or the over the counter and take nicotine patches and nicotine you know gums and those things so the chewing gums what happens actually you become addicted to that and possibly you are not aware we we are very much you know aware about those those things that when we started patches patches are so dangerous because people hide them in any when part of the body and say we are not using and they keep on using and therefore they remain addict and patch addict not only consumes the money but at the same time it is uh, leading to tobacco addiction to continue so therefore i will advise that this should be totally restricted the important thing uh, that all of all of you are saying a very right thing that's a very difficult to quit but i can tell you if you scientifically do it and you do with the the uh, well power and those things they are definitely material but important thing is that uh, it has to be scientific and scientific means the first thing is that what happens why a person quits why a person is not able to quit and why a person joins tobacco and why other person does not join you are in the same peer group but not necessarily everybody will do it the reason for that is because what happens is that some people don't have a strong will power that they may resist all these things and may not do it so what is important is that first of all is a state of mind which needs to be counseled and changed and that concept to be changed the perception to be changed and that is better done by a counselor counselor can be anybody who is experienced but i tell you what gave us success in king george medical university i found that the psychologists clinical psychologists are very useful and if you have those persons available you can go to them they will change you from the you know prime prime primary condition stage 1 to stage 2 and ultimately you'll find you will be agreeing to you know quit tobacco many times patients come to us and they say i am not going to leave tobacco and they start running away and when they, say, they go to psychologist the concept is changed so therefore that is very important second is that the about hazards uh, i was trying to listen to you but maybe i i missed it you should also tell is not only to the person concerned this also harms the people around especially especially smoking and in in this you know in chewing tobacco the problem occur because they keep on spitting everywhere and nowadays you know all these things are become more dangerous and therefore what is the there is a condition called a passive smoking which is you know possible if somebody is smoker in a family it can you know ca cause harms to almost everyone who is living there and even not only animals also i can tell you not only human being animals also and also inanimate objects for example in uh, this uh, a320 bus uh, airbus what happened that the filters were blocked sometime an accident was averted and that is why all flights became they no smoking nobody can smoke in the in the planes 
The reason is because they are very small and very you know, minute filters which can become blocked by the carbon. So what I will suggest is that it is difficult but not impossible. It is. It can be done with the help of a scientific method. There are some drugs to support also, but nicotine patch and nicotine replacement therapy it is called as NRT. It is is a one of the last choices, not very used commonly because if even if it is effective, then it goes to create a, another type of addiction and the family also gets fed up. That is one point. Second is that the, this can all lead to damage in the in the in the fetus which is growing, and in pregnancy. If somebody is, uh, has got a person in the family who is pregnant, then if you, somebody is smoking or, or the lady herself is smoking or taking tobacco, even in chewing form or SLT, which is called as, right? So what happens is this leads to a lot of problems. So next generation can also be, you know, destroyed. You'll find there can be a stillbirth, there can be a premature delivery, there can be, they may be having disfigurement, they may also mentally retard, retarded, or sometimes you'll find that they have congenital defects in the heart, in the spine, and many other conditions. So therefore, not only the person concerned, the all living and non-living things around, they all become affected. And especially the second generation can also be affected by this. So therefore, this leads to a, a very strong sustained and serial you know, damages to the society. And not only this, the financial part and those things are also very important. I really congratulate uh, whosoever has to uh, talk to you, maybe Bobby and Madam, that you came out with the, uh, all parts which I've heard till now is quite satisfactory and nicely. So therefore I'll congratulate all of you for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramakant you, for those insightful comments and also the, the speakers. Now I would like to uh, well, welcome Shreya Rawal and Durgesh Nandan Yadav on the topic education in India. Thank you, Sir Tash, for this warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Our topic for today is quality of education in India. Dean Dress and Amartya Sen in their book, An Uncertain Glory, India and Its Contradictions, have very clearly shown that while India has been leading the world in terms of GDP growth rate, its performance in social indices can only be compared with some sub-Saharan African countries. At the time of independence, we were second behind Sri Lanka in South Asia with respect to social indices. Today, we are barely above Pakistan. Rest of the South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, etc. have moved ahead of us. Literacy rate of India is 74% as of the 2011 census. Literacy rate of females is 65.5%, whereas the literacy rate among males is 82.1%. These measures do not reflect the quality of education, nor the knowledge or the ability of students. This is mainly because these figures as are inflated due to mass copying, which is a tendency among the students who study in India. Education in the current times is not a learning exercise which imparts knowledge, rather, it's an exercise to make students more marketable. Dr. Sandeep Pandey says that purpose of education is to impart and imbibe constitutional values of democracy, equality, liberty, secularism, socialism, and fraternity. Its objective is to create an equitable society. However, in the current times, education perpetuates and strengthens the hierarchical and social structures in our society. For example, there are 100 posts reserved for SEs and ST professors at IIT BHU, but these posts are never filled as the candidates are found not suitable enough, and thus minority or reserved classes never make it to the top posts, and thus education perpetuates the class line. Justice Sutti Ragarwal says in his historic order that there are three categories of primary schools. One, which caters to 90% of the population, run by the state board, which is in shabby condition. There are semi-elite schools run by private entities, which are better than the government schools. Then, there are the schools which cater to a limited class of elite society. In India, the intention of bureaucrats and officials is not to create a just society. Education is used as a means 
the thrive at the cost of the poor and the underprivileged. In 1964, a Kothari Commission was formed to look into the matter of education in our country. It submitted two recommendations. It said there should be a formal school system wherein there is equality in access to education by all children, and no parent would have to send their children to private schools. Another recommendation was that a neighborhood school plan should be implemented. to end the segregation between schools for the privileged and the underprivileged this recommendation implies that a child goes to a school nearest to him this basically means that if rich and poor are living in the same locality they go to the same school without any distinction regarding their income or their caste or any anything of that of that sort the kothari commission also recommended that the expenditure on education should be increased to 6% of gdp To ensure free and compulsory education for all, it's been several years since the Kothari Commission submitted its report, but none of the governments have cared to implement its recommendations. For example, the budget outlay of IIMs was four hundred fifteen point four one crore, a massive decline of fifty nine point nine percent from last fiscal allocation of rupees one thousand thirty six crore. The Indian Institute of Technologies (IIT) has been allocated rupees six thousand two hundred twenty-three point zero two crore as against rupees sixteen three hundred twenty-six crore in the year twenty eighteen nineteen. Evidence shows that countries which implemented the formal school system have ninety to hundred percent literacy rate. No country in the world has achieved universalization of education without a strong state-funded. and state regulated formal school systems in 1993 the supreme court judgment was passed in the case unni krishnan in the case of unni krishnan versus state of andhra pradesh which made education free and compulsory and a fundamental right of a child under the age of 14 years after the judgment a psychia committee was formed to look if right to education would be made a fundamental right the committee concluded that a constitutional amendment would be passed and the right to education would be incorporated as a fundamental right this particular committee arose the question of financing it the bureaucrats and officials asked the question if the government had enough resources to afford and to make elementary education free and compulsory for all for this purpose the tapas majumdar committee was formed which released a report that only an increment of 0.86% of the gdp in 1989-90 was required to achieve universalization of education 0.86% was required and it was an increment from the current expenditure thus the constitution passed 86th amendment act act 2002 inserted article 21a in the constitution of india to provide free and compulsory education of all children in the age group of 6 to 14 years as a fundamental right the right of children to free and compulsory education rte act 2009 which represents the consequential legal legislation envisaged under article 21a means that every child has a right to full time elementary education of satisfactory and equitable quality in a formal school which satisfies certain essential norms and standards section 121c of this act guarantees 25% seats to children from disadvantaged category which is on the basis of caste and medical conditions of parents and weaker sections under the economic criteria for free education from classes 1 to 8 in all schools except minority institutions so any poor children who could clear the criteria of caste or income could claim 25% seats in any private school however this law is just in paper and it is not followed in practice the best example is of city montessori school which refuses to admit children under this quota it has openly flouted the law by refusing to accept 31 children recommended 
by the district level education officer in 2015-16 55 children in 2016-17 296 children in 2017 and 18 250 children in 2018-19 193 to 194 children in 2019-20 no action is ever taken against the school as as it teaches children of influential people like judges administrators and bureaucrats to influence the law and thus the school escapes scratch free there are petitions pending against the school however no action is ever taken the government of india is well aware of the problems in the indian education system but has been slow in responding to them the school infrastructure is in poor state and many school teachers are not properly qualified with 31% of them not having a degree 40% of schools are without electricity it has been reported that since 2009 96% of chil- of the children are being enrolled into primary school but the annual status of education report aser 2017 states that children's literacy has not risen a lot 14 year old children are often unable to read text which a child of 8 could be expected to read students of private schools showed a little improvement in their ability to read whereas the students of government schools showed no sign of improvement the proportion of children in class 3 who can read class 1 books increased slightly from 38.8% in 2012 to 40.2% in 2013 and this increase was seen in private school students however the percentage of government school students of class 3 who could who could uh, read class 1 textbooks was only 32% in 2013 almost the same as in 2012 among children enrolled in government schools the percentage of class 5 children able to read class 2 level textbook has shown a marked decline from 50.3% in 2009 to 43.8% in 2011 in 2013 only 41.1% student of class 5 could manage to read even standard 2 textbook The statistics also show that only 9.5% of government schools are RTE compliant. In other words, only 9.5 of the percent of the schools are providing free education to children between the ages of 6 and 14. When it comes to funding, Section 7 of the RTE Act explicitly explicitly states that it is the responsibility of the government to provide funds to ensure the proper implementation of the act. However, the government continues to hold back on financing the education sector in india as far as uh, the 1960s the kothari education commission uh, has suggested that budget allocation for education should be 6% and the government has promised to meet this figure despite these promises the current budget allocation is 3.8% uh, which is a increase from the previous years as you can see in, in the data the government expenditure on education in the last 5 years was on the average of 2.88% which is a decline from 3.19% for the previous 5 years the district information system for education dise data shows only 53% of the total government schools which form majority of schools in rural india have electricity connection only 28% of schools 18% government out of which 18% are government schools have a computer and 9% in which 4% government school and internet have an internet connection access to sanitation facilities poses a major impediment to student attendance especially girls and leads to drop out the annual state uh, of education report aser 2017 data found that only 68% of the toilet in government schools are usable despite the fill fill up provided by the swachh bharat swachh vidyalaya campaign which has increased the number of toilets across schools the usability of such uh, these structures remain questionable lack of water lack of lighting and electricity poor drainage systems and paucity of funds for maintenance and cleanliness have failed to feature on the agenda of sound wash w a s h water sanitation and hygiene ma- management in schools uh, education is important because it allows people to live fulfilled and dignified lives state have an obligation to provide education to their citizens and unfortunately in india that obligation is not fulfilled 
the problem rectified above can be resolved by implementing the Allahabad High Court judgment that stated that, ch that children of government servants, semi-government servants, local bodies, representatives of people, judiciary, and all such persons who receive perks, benefit, or salary, etc., etc., from public exchequer or public fund, send their children to primary school run by the UP board. It further says that appropriate uh, provisions can be made to ensure that child ch uh, of above uh, mentioned categories are compelled to receive primary education in primary schools run by the board. The court could not be uh, could could not have been more emphatic. This order will benefit the 90% of the children in India who have uh, presently no choice but to attend substandard primary schools where there is hardly any teaching. When the quality of these schools will improve, only then every child in India will be gar guaranteed quality education at the primary level. The court also thinks that such measures will uh, result in boosting the education system edu uh, and the social equation by allowing, chil allowing children who are poor and rich to study together. The children of poor will get a different kind of atmosphere, confidence, and opportunities bringing about a grassroots revolution. Once the quality of government schools improves, then people will automatically start sending their children to government schools and then, uh, and then provide, uh, then the private schools will slowly go out of the existence. Most countries which have achieved 99 to 100% literacy rate have done it through government and education programs. Thank you. That's it from our side. And uh, in case of any question, please uh, please type in the questions and we'll address it at the last of, last of the uh, talk. Thank you very much, Shreya and Gurgesh, for bringing up a very, very uh, important issue uh, about universalization of education. And uh, the Right to Education Act was, despite not being idle, has been a step in the right direction. But uh, as has been mentioned by Shreya, it is being flouted. Uh, and not put to full use in many states of India. In some states, it's really doing very well, uh, but it cannot be said for all. And uh, we are just curious to know about the education system in Philippines, because uh, uh, Nanette, would you like to share about uh, what the system of education is like? Because I believe literacy, literacy rate is very, very high in Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually you're right, Shoba. The literacy rate in the Philippines is quite high. In fact, um, developed countries call the Philippines as a diploma milling country. Meaning to say, um, almost 100% of those who enroll for the university or college are actually graduating from that course. But the only problem in the country in terms of education, the, the course that they were able to complete does not match the skills that I have. And also most of those courses taken by students and they graduated from it, there are no available employment or jobs appropriate for the course that they were able to finish. So that is the current situation in the Philippines. And then at the same time, um, the current education system in the Philippines, if one wants to go abroad and continue studying, it does not actually match the, the education system of that country. For instance, if I graduate from here and I wanted to continue or work as a nurse in Australia, I wouldn't be able to qualify. I have to enroll for another two years in order to qualify for the nursing qualifications in terms of education in another country. So looking at the overall um, curriculum in the country, it's a, bit late, um, it's a bit late by a year or two. In order to respond to this, um, to this uh, deficiency, the previous president or the previous uh, administration came into this decision together with the Senate to revise the system. We now have the so-called K-12 K K education, wherein the number of years in the elementary has been extended, and then it has been class classified. And then further from the elementary, you go up the next level, which is um, the higher, the senior and the junior um, education level, which is equivalent to high school and then the college as well, that is a continuing process. But uh, there, are, there are several streams, like for instance, not everyone can pursue college. Those uh, who will not pass the examination will have to qualify for the vocational courses. Meaning to say this is making ready for the students immediately after they graduate, they can immediately get employed in a particular commerce or in a particular job. So, 
uh, entering the school is immediately assessing the skills of the student and matching it to the course that they need to, to, uh, to get so that when they graduate, automatically they have a job. So that is actually existing now in the Philippines, but a lot of parents are not in favor of the said uh, system for now. And right now in our, in our, um, in our Senate and in Congress, the K-12 education system is being reviewed because uh, from the first two batches of those who graduated, until now they ended up without a job. So that is the current situation in the country in terms really, of the education. Right, but Philippines is still providing a lot of workforce in many fields uh, yes. uh, to, foreign, uh, to the other nations. Uh, and yes. are the schools or uh, are they state-owned schools or you have a mix? Hello, Shoba. Hello? Yeah, Can I you? didn't hear you. Okay. Are the schools all uh, public uh, state schools, government schools, or are they private schools also? Yeah, we have a combination of, uh, I'm actually, we have schools uh, which is funded and managed by the government. We also have private schools wherein students need to pay a humongous amount of money for their tuition fee. And then we also have among the private schools, we have the so-called elite schools. These are the top A schools, uh, which uh, manages the, the school system in three semesters so that the students are able to graduate in two years time. And then from there, um, I mean, from, from the elementary level, we have, the, we have both public and private. High school is the same, college is the same. But uh, all state universities and colleges are funded by the government. So these are all government scholars and they are pre-selected uh, going through a battery of examinations. So those who are qualified and have, have, has passed the examination will go into the university of the government free of uh, free of tuition and free of everything, including dormitories and allowances. Uh, that is for the university managed and uh, funded by the government. But for the private, they have to pay full tuition fee, including books, including internship, if there are practical uh, uh, practicum or internships. So that's how it is right now. But the situation of the public schools for elementary and high school, which is part of the K to 12, is not as good as the private, meaning to say um, the amenities and, um, and the provisioning within the school, they lack the equipment, they don't have computers. So everything is being taught theoretically, but they don't have any hands on. It is just now that the government is responding to the deficiencies in the different public schools so that the students will be at par with the students that are studying or are enrolled in the private school. So that is the current situation in the country in terms of the education. But if you are to ask me, I would rather go back to the, to the old education system in the country where have you have the primary, the secondary, and then you have the tertiary. Prior to the tertiary, there is a battery of examination to determine if you will be qualifying for a university course or a vocational course. And both of which are trying to prepare the students once they graduate uh, from the school to enter into a job or an entrepreneurial um, entrepreneurial enterprise, or you pursue your college either to be a doctor, to be an accountant, so whatever field of expertise you wanted to get into. So it was actually based on my, on my experience. The previous one is better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ramakan, can you share something about uh, private the medical education. colleges versus the government medical colleges? Sure, madam. Uh, am I audible? Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, sure. Yes, yes, I have yes. some experience yes. because I worked for a few years as principal there. Uh, I will say that uh, mm -hmm. these colleges uh, are not to the mark. They are, as we see in the medical universities and medical colleges, which are of repute. And you don't find the proper faculty. The only place uh, where you can find proper faculty are those colleges which are established and most of them, uh, them are government colleges. So therefore the problem occurs because the students, they come, they have to be you know, uh, brought up into the you know, classes. It is very difficult because for administration to be very tough, 
putting fines and those things, you still find that the, that attitude is not there. And many times what I have felt, which is a mistake by the parents, that they try to fulfill their dreams through the, you know, the children. Their, their children. And that is wrong. Yes. The, when I have talked to the ch children, why don't you come to the classes? And uh, I said, I will not punish you. you. Just let me know. They told me I wanted to be a model. Somebody said I wanted to be something, a singer. I wanted to be a film artist, something of that type. So that is the blunder which mo most of the parents are doing, that you force for your dreams that should never be done. So therefore, I will say that the education there is, honestly speaking, not very satisfactory. I don't feel it satisfied. Is, yeah. Similar situation here. Yeah. Yes, that's the problem. You don't have the proper faculty. And the only place in these colleges hardly will be a one principal or somebody who is retired from some you know, great institutions or premier institution. That will be the only person who is qualified and proper. Rest are only filling the blanks. Mm -hmm. They don't serve that purpose. And I'm sure a time will come that people will regret. They should, either There should be something done. That the faculty should be proper, or you should reduce the number of so such colleges. They are keeping on increasing. What is the sense of increasing when you don't have the, the doctors trained with the passion? The doctor has to be a passionate person. It's not the money you can earn by so many methods. It's not the question of only profession. This is a noble profession, so we have to be dedicated. And once you're somebody not studying, not learning, then how can he treat patients? So therefore, they become a failure, and uh, they don't work. So therefore, I will not uh, appreciate that the private colleges are doing good. They're not. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sir. And I think that is true that, that uh, we need to have a strong public education system and a strong public health system. Both of them, yeah. I think they are very important for any country mm -hmm. to progress. And uh, now over to Sartaj to continue, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, so now we have a, a pre-recorded session. Uh, where Dappan Chaudhary, Harshal Patidar, Manas Naidu, Nivedita Arjun, Shruti Ayer, and Shyam Sundar present their ideas on the COVID-19 impact. We will be playing the recording. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Today, me, Manas, along with Shyam, Dappan, Shruti, and Nivedita are presenting our views on the impact of COVID-19 on different classes in India. With more than 5 lakh cases, India is the fourth worst hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. The government has made efforts to curtail spread of the virus through serious lockdowns. Business has come to an all-time low, with the IMF predicting that India's GDP in the current financial year will contract by 4.5%. To a country that hasn't seen a contraction in its GDP since 1979, this definitely comes as a major shocker. Added to this, India's health sector being thrown into a crisis due to the upward trend in cases only makes matters worse. Despite the whole of India reeling from the impact of the pandemic, there seems to be a wide disparity between, uh, between the experiences faced by different income groups. Some of these disparities have been highlighted through our presentation. Thank you, Manas. Uh, the one with the burgeoning middle class has been how the world talks about India. Today, a pandemic threatens the middle class, a disease that hits above the belt, unlike cholera and malaria that struck the unwashed and unsheltered. COVID-19 doesn't distinguish between classes, but the af aftermath will certainly distinguish itself by hurting this mass in the middle. What must be noted is that the weak infrastructure is that successive governments have not focused on the healthcare system because the middle did not seem to need it. <clears throat> the middle class is faced with the following problems while it accesses the health facilities. 
First, the public versus the private trade-off. It has been observed that over 80% of the middle income group in India is dependent on public health care system, like government hospitals. <laughs> Whilst looking on the figures, roughly 62% of the hospital beds and ICU beds and 56% of the ventilators are under private ownership. And yet, only 10% of the COVID cases have been taken under private treatment. <laughs> this is a clear indication on the burden being placed on the public sector. This is seen in Bihar, which has been, uh, which has witnessed an almost complete withdrawal of the private health sector and has nearly twice the bed capacity of public facilities. In states where private hospitals have not opened their doors to the poor to enhance and supplement the government's effort to ensure public health, the government in question have taken control of some of them in lieu of the National Disaster Management Act of 2005. <laughs> India's public hospitals have only 7,13,986 beds, including 35,699 in intensive care units and 17,850 ventilators. Owing to such shortages and special allocation of facilities for lower class migrant laborers, government officials, etc., the middle class is faced with lack of medical attention and forced to attain help from private institutions, which are financially taxing. When one dwells into the domain of private health, it is key to note the lethargy in the acceptance of health care system as one of the primary importance. Regulating and democratizing private health care facilities has been put on the back burner for six years by state policy. With dependence on private health care, problems of refusal to treat COVID-19, policing of money, and provision of substandard facilities, and overcharged services overwhelms the middle class. Let's take the example. Let's take an example. The case of Nilesha. When his 47-year-old wife tested positive for COVID-19, the middle-class man of Isanpur resorted for aid in the civic health line. No one bothered when he admitted his wife in the SVP hospital, due to which he had to shift to ALG hospital and then to civil hospital, where they were kept waiting for hours with no success. Exhausted and left with no option, Shah drove his wife all the way to SCG Multispeciality Hospital at Mithakuli. She was finally admitted to the private hospital. Since then, she ha uh, since then, she has been undergoing treatment and her condition is currently stable. However, the plight of this 51-year-old ma uh, man has made many middle-class families shudder in fear. Secondly, the treatment of non-COVID patients. We have a very weak health system, which relies on a substitution effect, which means if there is a large number of people coming in, the rooms have to be vacated and isolation wards have to be set up. It is not that we have spare capacity in our governments or private hospitals. We are substituting other patients, people who have come in for elective surgery, non-serious cases, and so on. For over a month, in almost all public hospitals, OPD and non-emergency services had been stopped so that all resources could be diverted for combating COVID-19 and emergency medical care. As confirmed by several media reports, reduced access to both out, uh, outpatient and hospitalization services is providing to be fatal for several middle class and uh, non-coronavirus patients, both communicable and non-communicable, who cannot afford the treatment and aids provided by the private hospitals not overtaken for COVID. Even pregnant mothers and newborn children, as the ICDs and MCH services take a backseat, have suffered due to the lockdown. More children will die of starvation and lack of health care than from the coronavirus infection. As people resort to housebirths, and neonatal care facilities come to a standstill, the mortality rate among the middle class has also taken a hit. Lastly, despite the increase in the number of dedicated COVID facilities like health centers, treatment centers, quarantine centers, what the government continues to gloss over is the issue of availability of human resource, including both doctors and the lower level support staff that keeps the hospitals run, sweepers, ambulance drivers, and other unskilled persons find it harder to travel to conduct their jobs beside being afraid of being in high susceptibility, high susceptibility areas. Unavailability of such personnel not only causes staggering issues of immediate hospital related impact, but also lead to cramping of multiple patients on one bed due to the slowed down cleaning process with an added surge in patients and overflowing of morgues as well. Thus, the middle class remains subject to treatment that sometimes doesn't adhere to the most basic COVID-related norms of social distancing. Now I would like to hand over to Shruti for further details. Thank you, Shan. So I will be 
classes faced in terms of their mental health because of the worldwide pandemic. So uh, when the lockdown was imposed, migrants and daily wage laborers were the first to be affected and they were also the worst to be affected as will be elaborated upon later in this session. But as the months pass, the stress that comes with economic uncertainty and its extremely significant impact on mental health will climb, will make its way to the class, up the class ladder, bringing the lower uh, and upper mid, uh, low middle class and middle middle class people into its fold. The causes for stress imposed on these groups ranges from work life stability, postponed promotions, payment cuts, and sometimes even loss of jobs. The younger generation of this demographic is also impacted by the sheer uncertainty of examinations and admissions. This is accompanied by the constant access to media and news channels, saturating them with staggering figures and dangers are bound to have a deep impact on the psyche of this demographic. The reasons for the impact and the impact itself are difficult to grasp but are of utmost importance and has been further simplified to be studied under the following subcategories. So uh, the first um, element of study is the gendered element of the impact of the virus. So the lockdown has disproportionately and unfortunately not surprisingly been harder on the women than men. This can be vividly seen in the rise of the domestic violence that, that doubled across the country since the lockdown. And this is definitely a form of physical abuse. The psychological impacts of being stuck in the same house as the abuser are far reaching and devastating. A reason for this spike has been seen yet again in the rise of frustration due to economic uncertainty, which results in wending of the same physical violence. Women fear reporting to the police in fear of furthering the abuse they face, thereby making them feel extremely helpless. Reaching out to counselors and other sources of help is not a viable option in such times either. Quoting the NCW, that's the National Commission of Women Chief Rekha Sharma, um, she says the following, the main reasons for the rise of domestic violence is that the men at home uh, is that the men at home are taking out their frustration on women and they refuse to participate in domestic work. Women are also confined within the four walls of the house and they cannot share their grief with anybody. Further, another reason for gender-based impact on the middle class during the lockdown traces back to the availability of domestic help. In middle, classes, uh, in middle class homes across the country, especially in big cities, it's common to have a domestic servant. The latter are not living and the burden of household chores falls on the shoulders of the women of the household, irrespective of their employment status. The psychological impact of having to bear the burden of most household act activities is devastating and overwhelming. Quoting Varka Chilani, a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist in Mumbai's Deilavati Hospital, uh, she says, not used to getting their hands dirty, many men are struggling to cope. They feel bossed around to do the dishes and wash their clothes. Their ego is getting bird bruised as men are unable to stand being told to help. Stereotypical ideologies exist. It's the, it's the woman's job to cook, clean, and wash. It's the man's job to earn. So even though we seem to have progressed in paying lip service to being liberal, the truth is that we are confined to the real mindsets of our partners. Um, further, moving on to the second category of study, that's living in isolation. This might seem like quite an easy task when it comes to a demographic that does have a roof above their heads and can afford basic health facilities, but a generation conditioned and cultured by the forces of capitalism is not used to finding time for concomitant and congen dwelling and is often exposed to the worst existential truths themselves. That's basically to say that spending time alone with your thoughts is taking a toll on this particular generation and this is a more serious, sorry, this demographic and it's more serious of an issue than we give credit for. Living with family and at home individuals from the country have committed suicide at the thought of being in isolation. This extends to being stuck in four, in, in four walls of people who are emotionally abusive with no escape and this includes family members as well. Being employed, sorry, excuse me. Being employed in job uh, and sectors that involve traveling and social interaction, a feeling of drifting away and a feeling of being lost is quite common. Seventy-five percent Indians find it quite inconvenient to work from home, claiming that it blurs the lines between home and work. Another point to note is that this demographic houses a lot of small business owners as well. 
these individuals often have a feeling of responsibility towards the employees and staff they keep and are in quite a crisis because their business itself is at a standstill. Living in isolation sometimes stands as a cause as well for gender-based violence stated in the previous point. According to a clinical psychologist, um, PE kits and other protective um, measures, while trying to maintain the emotional model of the patients they adhere to is quite a steep ask. A large portion of the healthcare professionals are experiencing symptoms of anxiety, depression, insomnia, and psychological distress. Besides nurses who form the backbone of the emotional support system, the frontline health workers who are most susceptible to the virus are in immense psychological distress as well. This uh, importance of the, the importance of this peaks as the sheer fear of the situation takes away from the quality of work provided by these individuals, which is bound to have a magnanimous impact on the country system at large. Quoting Dr. Shubhangi Parker, a retired psychiatrist from KEM Hospital, dealing with uh, the pandemic has a significant negative impact on the mental health of healthcare workers. These people have handled many a disaster, but this is different kind of crisis. The fear of getting infected is like is exactly emotional and mental toll on all of them. Um, I'd further like to pass the baton on to my colleague Darpan to um, get into the low, uh, migrant labor and uh, daily wage workers impact of the pandemic in this country. Uh, so uh, I will be further continuing the points made by my colleagues. Uh, from the perspective of people who belong to low-income families. So first up, we have the health facilities. So as we all know that people who belong to lower-income families, uh, they have no option but to go to uh, public hospitals and centers. And the limitation of this country's public health system are very well known. Like India's public hospitals have only 7 lakh plus beds, including around 35,000 plus intensive care units and around 17,000 plus ventilators, according to a recent study done by CDDEP and Princeton. Uh, the general perception behind the inadequate provision and availability of healthcare services is generally attributed to the country's developing nation status. However, uh, India lag lags behind, uh, lags behind its BRICS brick peers on the health and quality index. Uh, as per the National Health Profile 2018, India's public health spending is less than 1% of the country's GDP, which is much lower than some of its neighbor. In fact, uh, according to the World Health Organization, WHO, India finishes second from the bottom amongst the 10 countries of its region for its percentage spending of GDP on public health. Uh, similar trends for India are observed on indicators like hospital beds per thousand people. As per OECD data available for 2017, India reportedly has only 0.53 beds available per thousand people as against 0.87 in Bangladesh, 2.11 in Chile, 1.38 in Mexico, 4.34 in China and 8.05 in Russia. Uh, one of these, uh, one of the obvious reasons why uh, public health care has not been a priority for successive governments of India lies in the fact that India's middle class did not need it. And uh, so CDDEP Princeton study shows that private hospitals have around uh, 12, lakh, 12 lakh beds, 60,000 ICU beds and 30,000 ventilators. Currently in India, most of the COVID-19 treatment is being done in the public facilities. But as the pandemic uh, progresses, it will be critical to expand the outreach of healthcare services by involving the private sector as an equal partner and stakeholder. Despite private hospitals accounting for 62% of the total hospital beds, as well as ICU beds and almost 56% of the ventilators, they are handling around only 10% of the workload and are reportedly denying treatment to the poor, as was mentioned by Sham. Uh, this is prominently being seen in Bihar and many other states, which has witnessed an almost complete withdrawal of the private health sector and has nearly, which has nearly twice the bed capacity of public health facilities. In states where private hospitals have not opened their doors to the poor to enhance the supplement, the government's effort 
to ensure the public health the government in question have taken control of some of them now moving on to the impact on health and emotional well being nivedita will be taking over uh, thank you darpan uh, all right so the further spread of covid 19 in india must be considered in the context of the changing socio economic pattern of infection and the larger socio economic reality of india as we can see in these two maps of delhi and kolkata the containment zones coincide with the neighborhoods of the city where the poor and minority communities live these communities are marked as carriers and threats and therapeutic social distance distancing leads to a much harder form of exclusion the wire had conducted um, one is next slide please thank you the wire had conducted daily phone surveys of respondents in residential areas of delhi's industrial areas from april 6 to april 18 the majority of the sample consisted of daily wage workers in factories construction or self employed in the informal sector they live in clusters with very high density which makes social distancing particularly challenging furthermore assessments by the central pollution control board show that these clusters are critically polluted and do not meet safety parameters in terms of air water or soil pollution making the health of the residents particularly vulnerable to the virus only about 10% of the sample report having fallen sick after the lockdown mainly with a combination of symptoms fever fever and cough um the there were a handful of covid-19 positive cases that they know of however some of the sampled areas are designated containment zones for covid-19 over 60% of both genders strongly agree with the statement that people living near them are not attending social gatherings practicing social distancing and are washing their hands regularly this survey also threw light on the emotional well-being of the respondents with both men and women saying that they worry more about their family's financial adequacy than about their health though the difference is not significant more than one third of both women and men have difficulty sleeping overall women appear to be more stressed than men interestingly these households also exhibit some hope in regaining their employment because they perceive the loss of income and jobs as temporary despite that hope their psychological impact is high and one can expect this to worsen if the hopes of regaining work and employment are not borne out as we move beyond the recovery period now i hand over to manas to conclude the session to summarize amid the covid covid-19 pandemic all sectors of society have taken a major hit with some being affected more than others the lower classes problems have only been multiplied with financial instability complementing the unavailability and inaccessibility to resources the public health sector has proven not to be up to the mark and equipped enough to cater to such a large population added upon this the poor living conditions and inability to practice social distancing paints an increasing difficult increasingly difficult picture for the lower class the middle class on the other hand lies in a gray area unlike the lower classes uh, sorry unlike lower classes lack uh, they lack special allocation of facilities that has pushed the middle class towards private healthcare and more expensive essential services this paired with the rapidly increasing rates of unemployment amongst the middle class has pushed a large majority towards an increasingly uncertain future the lower and the middle classes suffer mainly from uncertainty the uncertainty of having a stable financial source and the uncertainty of physical and mental health well being thus understanding of the problems faced by different sectors of society need to be understood and catered to accordingly with both these sectors contributing massively to the active labor force of the country this is an issue that needs to be addressed immediately uh thank you we will now be open to questions i uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing out a very wide picture of the impact of covid-19 and uh, though the virus knows no boundaries uh, but its impacts are gendered and they are uh, affecting different social classes in a different manner and 
the public and private health response is diff uh, has been different also. Nenet, we would like you to share your views on that. What is the situation in Philippines uh, on public versus private health care? And one more point I would like you to enlighten us about is about the stigma. You have worked in the field of HIV uh, for very long. And uh, the lessons we have learned in fighting HIV stigma and discrimination. Uh, how can they be useful in applying? Because now there's a lot of stigma which we see around COVID-19. Yeah, you are right. Stigma is now enormous related to COVID-19 here in the Philippines. Um, having the experience of uh, working in the area of HIV, dealing with stigma and discrimination, it has a similar situation for COVID right now. Like for instance, in my situation, I am experiencing stigma and discrimination around the issue of COVID because they know for a fact that I work with health providers. I usually go to the infectious hospital. So the moment that I, that I go out, people are actually shying away from me. They're actually doing a social distancing. So how are we going to deal about with, with a stigma related to COVID based on the experience and learnings from HIV and AIDS? We need to do an enormous amount of educating the public, trying to tell them what COVID is all about, how it is being prevented, how transmission is happening, and what can the community do about it in order to, uh, in order to avoid getting the virus. And then on top of that, the Department of Health should be doing an enormous amount of networking and coordinating with the different sectors, multi-sectoral approach, in dealing with the problem. So we, know, we really, know, we need, really know, we need to do a lot of the, the education and trying to set an example of um, working and dealing with someone who has recovered from, from the COVID-19 uh, disease. Right now, a lot of people who have recovered and had been discharged from the hospital are being part of the education component coming out of the different tri-media or the different kind of media, social media, television and radio, trying to share their experiences. It's not only people uh, coming from the community who have recovered from H, I, I mean COVID, but rather people coming from the uh, higher level of society, coming out and then trying to share ex their experiences is one among the best approaches that we currently uh, is being used now in the country. So there are a lot of personalities right now. And then uh, the, bis uh, I mean the, 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 the entertainment, the entertainment partners, the artists, the movie actors and actresses and coming out as well, uh, trying to provide support for the health workers, which is being the number one stigmatized people in the Philippines, because according to the community people or according to a larger number of, uh, people in the general population. It is the health workers who carry the virus because they deal uh, directly with the patients and then they go out. So among that area uh, on stigma with the health providers, the people from the movie industry are the ones providing support and providing the, edu the, the education that stigma around COVID-19 will not be able to help, but rather it will only aggravate the situation and the condition. So education really is number one, and that is what is being done in the Philippines. And that is also based on our experience in dealing with uh, HIV in the early days. So we need to tell people what is COVID, what COVID is all about, how to prevent getting it, and what we can do in order to prevent further infection. So that is what we can uh, share at the moment. Hopefully, as we come along, because we do not know a lot yet about COVID. It is, it is evolving, new information are coming out from the Department of Health every day, and we are guided by the information coming out from the WHO. Uh, and also because I think the mode of spread is also different if you compare to HIV. In the earlier mm -hmm. days, yes, there was a lot of stigma, but as uh, uh, medical evidence uh, came out that it is not spread by touch or just by simply yes by mosquito bite yeah yeah but here it is a different situation a little bit a very different situation the transmission is very much different so yes. we really need, need to do a lot of scientific um, research 
and then all the information that we need to get out to the people must be evidence-based so that we are able to encourage them uh, to believe in what your messages are, the messages you're trying to cut across to them. Yes, yes, rightly so. And what about the public and uh, private healthcare uh, response there in Philippines to COVID-19? Okay, in terms of the response clinically, uh, we have one and the same protocol which is being implemented in public hospitals and the same is true with a private hospital. So all the guidance in clinically managing COVID comes or emanated from the DOH. So we have a standard guideline and the DOH working with the infectious uh, and microbio infectious disease and microbiology society, they work together in coming up with guidelines. And then at the same time, they are being guided by the experiences in uh, other countries which have had COVID ahead of us. And uh, the Department of Health is also providing uh, support in terms of supplies to the private hospitals because uh, the, the guidance from the DOH is that no hospital will drive away uh, patients or clients who are experiencing COVID, uh, COVID illness or COVID related um, situation. So they have to be admitted or they have to be responded to. And then from there, from the triage, they have to be classified. If they are mild with comorbidities, they are admitted. If there are mild cases without comorbidities, they will be placed in a quarantine, but monitored on a daily basis. For critical cases, automatically they are confined or admitted to the hospital. And for the severe case with comorbidities, immediately they are into the ICU management. So. That's how it is being done here. We have uh, one standard clinical management guideline, which is being implemented in both public and private hospitals. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. And we have one more coincidence with our two chairpersons today, and both are great animal lovers. Uh, and I think both of you would be happy to know that Dr. Ramakant is a great lover of dogs, and I think Nenet's home is open to all and every animals, and are you getting more of them these days, and are you feeding more uh, stray animals these days in times of COVID? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, so uh, both, both of them are animal lovers, and uh, Dr. Ramakant, would you like to share something about uh, the impact of COVID and particularly pri private and public health services in India? Sure. Uh, actually, she has already been, uh, you know, uh, sharing the experience from Philippines very nicely. But I will tell that uh, in our place, as it as it is, the government issues certain guidelines, but uh, everybody has become expert of co Corona, and uh, people are talking different ways. So I find even a layman on the road is also telling some treatment, and uh, there is utter confusion. But except uh, I'll talk of medical institutions and medical, uh, the proper medical institutions where the guidelines are there and we are following them. But uh, then as, because this is something which is a new disease and uh, people are understanding, therefore we must be seeing every time what is happening is lockdown is extended because epidemiologists are the right person to tell about how this virus will behave because they will base their you know information on the basis of the experience with the epidemiology that uh, and what is said is that at least when it will multiply by six times in a day then it the plateau will start coming down because by that time you will have the recovered patient much more than the infected so actually we describe it as sir as are susceptible patients ir infected and then recovered once you find the larger number of recovered patient will be there then you'll find that the infection rate will drop because the community has become now immune to that you know, virus this time. So that is one part. The treatment part, I will say, is really, I will say it's very difficult and pitiable. We can't hide that part. In all institutions, there is so much of crowds, there is so much problem, and uh, the money part, which is also important, private sector, naturally, they're investing a lot of money to, to manage those patients. In government hospitals, also, it is a difficult problem. And uh, most of the patients who are cold cases, they are being shifted for surgery or for treatment for longer time. So therefore, there are a lot of problems. And uh, still, anyway, we are trying to improve day by day. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to cope with in a, in a few months' time. And then people will learn the discipline. It will be a sort of new education system by which people have learned how to live. 
how to be clean, how to remain healthy, and this will continue because next time this virus may change its, its you know its train, and you may end up in trouble again, and some other virus may come. So we'll have to learn to live with the proper hygiene and proper dictum, which we have almost learned in lockdowns. Lockdown has only was done for avoiding infection, and now gradually this will be, as you are seeing, is being released. Now regarding the animals, you say. Really, you are very right. You, you caught a very important point. Will you believe when we go to morning walk, we find large number of dogs and people. My daughter is Pooja, who she is also very fond of these doctors. It takes a lot of you know, yet edibles for them, biscuits, and she keeps on distributing them. And the time has come when we come back. Our car is surrounded by dogs waiting for, for biscuits and their their edibles. And when I was uh, going to different place, now we are going in a there's a place called a riverfront. It's a beautiful place, but then we were going passing through initially uh, in in side lanes, and then at that time, will you believe it? I found lot of people, not one or two, lot of people giving food to dogs, lot of people giving food to even bulls, to cows, and to different animals more moving on the road. So actually, it was a pitiable condition at that time. That time is almost over now, and uh, besides. So human beings, you will find the animals also are getting better because gradually they are getting able to reach to the houses. They get some food, but on the same time, lot of you no know, love has emerged because we have seen them getting thin, they are cachectic, marasmic. So that's why what happened. That uh, it is very true. You have picked up a very right point. Morning, yes, it is. It is the point we make it that we give for different, you know. It's, even pups are there, so we have to keep them separate. Some I am giving, some to my, my friend, Pooja is giving some, so that's happened. But it's a really seen to see. Next time, if you want, I will show you a photograph where a lot of dogs surround and wait for her car because they recognize and they smell it. That They know it when they will come back and they will get the biscuits and they will get you know, different other, other materials. So that's very true, it's a very difficult time for humanity, also for animal kingdom. And a lot of animals must have perished also, so, uh, but this was done. And for birds, we have put water and we keep on searching for those things. Whatever we can do, that is what actually is very important besides, because we can't exist without animals. There is a, almost a cycle where everyone is required and uh, that is very important to take care. And whosoever are more you know, fortunate, it is their duty. We have all that duty that we have to look after less fortunate. Otherwise, you know, people can't, you know, do because their jobs have been lost. They don't have even today. You find a lot of people are jobless and nobody is keeping them. I have experience about drivers. They, so we had two drivers, but one at present is not coming. And do you know three months he has not come? So we thought you know, he will not come. We appointed another one. Now he is crying. That please keep me, but we can't. So this is happening at a larger scale in, in larger institutions and in large, in different places. It's a difficult problem. Government is supporting, is trying to help, but again, this needs to society also, and uh, we will play, play our own part. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, Sartaj, you can move forward. I think the next uh, presentation is on about the impact, economic impact of COVID. Yes, yes Sartaj. Thank you. So uh, now we have Shasha Chauresia and Akash Kumar presenting on COVID-19 and its economic impact. Over to you guys. Good evening, everyone. I am Shashwat Chauresia, a student of IIM Indore. Good evening, everyone. I am Akash Kumar, student at IIM Indore. We are going to present on the topic COVID-19 and its effects. We are thankful to CNS, Shobha ma'am and Bobby sir for providing us this opportunity. The year 2020 has brought severe challenges to the world. Coronavirus pandemic is one of the most disastrous epidemic that the world has faced. Gaining its existence from Wuhan, China, coronavirus created havoc by affecting almost the whole of the world. The pandemic is caused by a virus known as SARS-CoV-2. It is well reported about the adaptability of the virus to the human cell receptors and thus has tremendous speed in infecting human beings. 
what what changes this severe challenge has brought it has led us to realize the medical advancement yet to be made and the that we are not immune to these type of medical emergencies and pandemic the current society before the pandemic could never have imagined of any such epidemic causing such a great harm to the society even with the significant development that the healthcare sector has achieved considering the more modern technological advancement in the healthcare machinery medical geniuses have raised their arm in search of a cure indeed the virus has led to realization where the world needs to think about get going back and revising a uh, necessary healthcare production next the privatization of the healthcare is not the solution rather it is a matter of serious concern most private healthcare organization treat a illness as a way of earning profit the private healthcare sector cost much more than the public healthcare sector for the same treatment of a disease thus privatization leads to increase in social gap poor people who depend on government would be left out of out of the system so what should be the alternate to the privatization a potential alternate to privatization would be public private partnership one of the major reason for ineffectiveness of public healthcare system is lack of accountability ppp is public financing with private delivery that is private sector manages the healthcare system but the public sector uh, but the government funds the funds this uh, uh, healthcare system here government continues to play important role and bring about beneficial reforms to the healthcare system as government is an equal shareholder now uh, the consequences of the pandemic that we have faced are it stopped all kind of economic activities because of the nation announcement of nation wise nation wide lockdown it was a big shock to the international market and stock exchanges this lockdown was a preventive measure taken to stop the spread of the virus one of the good consequence of this uh, pandemic is that it promoted uh, hygiene hygienic habits there has been a surge in demand of hygiene products whereas the demands of other goods have have taken a dip there is also a change in the geopolitical scenario of the world due to this pandemic the rift between the uh, the economic giants the us and the china has increased due to this pandemic the manufacturing units are moving out of china in order to decrease the reliance of world over china now the most devastating consequence of this pandemic is the severe economic slowdown faced by major economies of the world here are the graphs which show the real gdp growth trend of india as uh, predicted by imf the real gdp growth of india has come down to 1.9 whereas the growth rate of us italy are negative uh, it is going to take a long time for the world to recover from this economic slowdown there are relief packages announced by the governments of various countries in response to corona pandemic these relief packages are a significant part of total gdp of these countries the gdp of countries have already taken a dig in this year and with a stop on economic activities amid lockdown it is a challenge for the governments to maintain a smooth flow china france india us uk all have spent a significant parts of their gdp on coronavirus relief packages data shows work are uh, loss in march april this year in various countries such as peru mexico canada us uk this is a big fraction of people employed but not working this had a severe impact on the economy data also suggests that a big part of the working population in various parts of the world who lost the jobs due to pandemic comprised of women this rings a bell when we think of achieving sustainable development goals where we talk about equity and justice and not leaving anyone behind countries with labor work as a primary earning occupation which is mainly in underdeveloped 
countries and some of the developing countries will face a severe challenge coping up with a slowdown it will be a huge blow to the respective economies as the people in these countries will be unemployed or will have to struggle through the process any kind of manufacturing process in such countries will also be challenging and it will only add to the intensity of blow on the economies where manufacturing and labor work are primary earnings for the people according to ilo there would be an increase in child labor due to an increment in unemployment rate before covid-19 around 100 million children were under ch uh, child labor but this number is likely to increase as it puts more children at risk of entering child labor it is very crucial to deal with the global economic problem in these tough times the governments need to think of well well coordinated and constructive measures both for international and intra country trade proceedings it will help in rebuilding phase of the economy world is on the verge of an emergency this is an urgent issue which is needed to be dealt with together though these measures would help but the truth lies in the womb of time thank you okay thank Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I think we can move on to the next presentation, and uh, then we can take uh, in comments from we've covered by them, and uh, has really enriched. So, Sarthar, you can move on. I think to the next yes, presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. So uh, now we have uh, Isha Garg and Suti Khandelwal on the topic of COVID nineteen and climate change. Uh, I welcome both of them to uh, speak. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? You are audible. Yes, you are audible. Okay. So, um, good evening, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. So, before I begin my discussion, I'd like to ask you all a question. What do you recall when I mentioned the November of twenty nineteen? So, here are a few things that happened last November. People in the United States were celebrating Thanksgiving. With their families in Canada, people were enjoying Western classical music during the Bach Festival. Hong Kong was enjoying their Clock and Clap Music Festival. In India, we were celebrating Chhat Puja in the north. But no, we do not associate November with these festivals. We remember it for something else. We identify it with the rise in spread of coronavirus. Since then, we have had numerous conversations around COVID-19. most of them have most of them have been intense tragic important very important but saddening so today my friend isha and i stuti will like to have a sanguine heartwarming conversation we are going to discuss about a positive impact of coronavirus we'll begin this discussion by talking about the recovery of our environment that has taken place while the world was under lockdown the drop in carbon emissions the unbelievably low amounts of pollution recorded in the air and water and the restoration of natural habitats of wildlife can be considered a miracle recovery but we most certainly cannot rely on miracles for saving our environment coronavirus has given us a one time opportunity to understand in depth the causes of environmental degradation and to take effective measures to save the environment The second half of the discussion will elaborate the course of future action for environment protection. The improvement in the surroundings were noticed by all. The healing witnessed and shared by people across the globe was also recorded by pollution monitoring facilities. Since 2005, when NASA satellites started recording nitrogen dioxide levels, it was under the lockdown that Washington observed its cleanest air, as stated by Barry Leffer. an atmospheric scientist from nasa cities from across the world observed a plummet in air pollution 46% in paris 35% in bengaluru 38% in sydney 29% in los angeles 26% in rio de janeiro and 9% in durban so according to the air quality index 
the average air quality recorded in new delhi used to be around 200 higher by 25 percent from the unsafe levels as per world health organization when the pollution level pollution level would reach their highest the air quality index reached 900 and sometimes even off the measuring scale but as the capital came to a sudden halt and remained under lockdown the air quality index observed a steep fall to 20. the insider compiled a brilliant piece where they compared images from before and after a 21 day lockdown here are some of them A similar improvement was observed in the water bodies. An environment scientist and professor, Mr. B.D. Joshi, informed in an interview with India TV today, and I quote, it is after a long time, the water quality of the Ganga River has become good for ritual sipping. In some stretches, the water has also become fit for drinking after its quality has been tested at different parameters. It is the best state the Ganga water has been in in the last 30 to 40 years despite government efforts and millions of rupees being spent for cleaning the river. This improvement says a lot about the cause of pollution as well. As stated by the professor, the remarkable levels of purity is due to the absence of any industrial pollutants and garbage. Massive improvements in the water quality were also observed in Yamuna. The falling pollution levels also benefited the wildlife. As reported by India Today, in the Ganga Ghats of Kolkata, critically endangered South Asian river dolphins were spotted after nearly 30 years. Waters turned pink in Navi Mumbai as the number of flamingos visiting increased this year due to the lockdown. Animals were also seen reclaiming spaces, as reported by The Guardian. Sika deer wandered through the city streets in Nara, Japan. Jacqueline's made a visit to the beach in San Felipe, Panama. Although the world has made a huge jump for recovery, there is the possibility for an even stronger rebound as the world has entered the unlock phase. But it is important to make note of the progress achieved during lockdown for two reasons. One is that now it is more than clear that pollution is an outcome of human activity and hence can be controlled by bringing this activity under the check. The second reason is that the refreshing sight of improvement in the environment has given us a glimpse of what the world can be like if the levels of pollution are reduced, thus a visualization of our goals. As was pointed out by Stuart Pym, a conservation scientist at Duke University, North Carolina, and I quote, it is giving us this quite extraordinary insight into just how much of a mess we humans are making of our beautiful planet. This is giving us an opportunity to magically see how much better it can be. Now I'd like to hand it over to Isha. Uh, hello everyone, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay, uh, I'd like to continue from where Stuti left off. So environment preservation has been on the cards for decades now. Despite elaborate plans on the international and national levels, there has been little to no success in this regard. However, the lockdown due to the coronavirus pandemic has been an eye opener for all humankind. As Tuti rightly said, the lockdown has resulted in a simultaneous process of realization and visualization. On one hand, it has made us realize the extent to which human activities influence the environment. On the other hand, it has helped us visualize what a world with controlled pollution levels and a better quality environment would look like. Now, these two things serve a very important purpose. It is said that goal visualization is of extreme importance for goal achievement. Picturing that final goal, which is a very difficult task, reinforces the belief that one can achieve that particular goal. The lockdown does this for us without any effort. The improved quality of environment during and after the lockdown presents a snapshot of the world when the environment has recovered. 
it instills the belief that with changes in our activities in our lifestyles we can protect our surroundings the lockdown has also helped us in giving us a road map if we introspect about the differences in our activities before and during the lockdown we can clearly identify the steps necessary for environmental protection the pollution levels would undoubtedly increase in the unlock phase but conscious effort can control the rise and help maintain the prescribed levels the lockdown has bestowed a head start upon us now it is our responsibility and the need of the hour to make full use of this opportunity and put consistent efforts for the preservation of our environment by adapting a sustainable lifestyle now these lifestyle changes have been easier for some and difficult for others there is a huge chunk of population that was pushed into even poorer conditions than the existing ones due to the lockdowns it is very important to understand the responsibility of each person in climate change each and e- each and every individual has a contribution in climate change and degradation of our environment and the richer have a higher share but the effect of this climate change is more upon the vulnerable and poorer sections of the society therefore climate justice should be adopted i would like to quote mary robinson the former president of ireland and the current chair of elder elders here she says climate justice insists on a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement with the people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart in simpler words climate justice brings a human centric approach in dealing with climate change it aims at safeguarding the rights of the vulnerable sections and sharing the burden and benefits of climate change equitably among all sustainable living has been regarded as a significant way to reduce the carbon footprint and deal with climate change if each individual lives sustainably they can reduce their own carbon footprint but not one person can do everything small efforts by all people have to be made for a huge overall impact if each individual makes small changes in their lifestyles both professionally and personally the entire world would benefit from it therefore it is the moral duty of every individual to take steps to reduce their carbon footprint as much as possible without neglecting the grievances of the vulnerable sections the lockdown has given us an opportunity to make this world a better place by environment preservation the statistics of air quality index pm 2.5 concentration pollution indices for water bodies are evidence enough of the impact of lockdown apart from these numbers the cleanliness in the surroundings can be felt by all climate change is happening because of human activities and interference although the rich have the highest carbon footprint climate change is responsible for the devastation of many many vulnerable groups and communities sustainable lifestyle is a possible way to improve the deteriorating condition of the environment this can be achieved if we set smart goals wherein smart stands for specific measurable attainable relevant and time bound the use of this goal setting technique and implementation of action plan can pave the way for a better quality environment since the lockdown has given us a snapshot of the better future with good quality environment the need for preserving our environment has strengthened and every individual should adopt sustainable living to achieve the same thank you thank you isha and uh, stuti for the uh, presentation now i would like to invite uh, our next speakers who are lakshmi narayan and ram kartikeyan on the topic of transportation current problems and future plans 
over to you guys. Oh, can can I interrupt here for a moment, please? Yes. Uh, sorry, can I interrupt? Because yes, we would yes, really please. like to uh, ask the chairpersons for their inputs uh, on the previous presentation, and. Yes, uh, as it was rightly focused that uh, environmental degradation and pollution is an outcome of human activity. And definitely we do not need a virus to improve the climate, but we need a change in our lifestyle and habits and consumption patterns. So uh, we would like our chairpersons to please uh, share their views on it and what needs to be done so that this improvement in uh, climate and environment lasts even when, and when COVID goes away also. Yes, Nenet, if you're there. Is Nenet there still? Yeah, yeah, I'm still yes. here. <laughs> yes, please. Can, can, what can we do? And that has really, because very often we say that, yeah, these are the positives of COVID. Uh, the positive of COVID in case of environmental improvement is that it has refocused on things which we had forgotten perhaps. So, yeah. and so changing our habits and consumption patterns and policies, I think, can help. So can you share some thoughts on that? Um, actually, when COVID came in, wow, it took a virus to clear the air in the Philippines. Because when the lockdown was um, implemented, transportation were not allowed to run in, in streets, either major streets, highway, or inner streets. Definitely all people were staying in their house. All jobs or offices were closed. And people are really locked down in their houses. So no consumption of diesel, gasoline, or all sorts of fuel that are contributing to pollution in the country. So what were the lessons learned from there uh, is that um, people, were, people were compelled to go back to the basic, like for instance, just doing the long distance walking, that's one. It provides, it, 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 uh, it keeps you fit and healthy by walking and lessening the pollution. The second learning that we have had there is that um, minimizing the use of vehicles that utilizes fuel that contributes to pollution is one way by which we can contribute to preventing further degradation of the environment and further uh, lessening the, the pollution in the air. So therefore it, uh, it made aware the community or the uh, Filipinos that the more you use fuel, the more you erode the environment, the more you pollute the, the air. So that, so that they also learned that a lot of cars and vehicles running in the major routes of the Philippines are dilapidated and should no longer be allowed to run in the streets. So that's one of the things that our transportation office has been looking into. And then second, it was a real realization for all of us that we need to come up with modernized vehicle that utilizes, like for instance, um, electrically charged vehicle that does not use diesel or gasoline. And then next is um, considering the use of bicycles that would contribute to the fitness and health of people and lessening um, the use of vehicles that use fuel. And with that, the roads are now being, um, how do you call it? The roads are now being managed and are providing uh, bicycle lanes and it also providing an area where people can just walk and limiting the area where in a motorized vehicle can run through. So we are in that stage right now uh, wherein people are being made aware of on how we can further prevent contributing to the pollution and degrading the environment. And then at the same time, the government is looking into the existing policies that are negating uh, preventing pollution, but rather looking into what specific policies can be uh, put out there to, to manage pollution and to improve further on the environment. 
So we, we haven't heard yet from the policymakers. Uh, they're still into this level of discussion on how we can sustain the minimal pollution that has been, uh, what, the, the minimal pollution that could happen in the country. And then at the same time, setting aside those that have contributed greatly to the pollution in the past. So we are still at that level. And then maybe based, uh, looking at the experience that has happened in terms of minimizing pollution, those learning may be integrated into the community education which is being done and mostly educating the children on what can be done in terms of limiting pollution and improving the natural resources and lessening degradation of the environment. So those are the things that we are seeing right now. Uh, what about in India? Do you have a similar experience? I think I, I agree 100% with you, Nanette, on what you are saying. And you'd be happy to know that Bobby has uh, taken to cycling in a big way. And uh -huh. <laughs> driving car all together. But in yeah. India, what we find is that with the lockdown taking place, again, all the private vehicles are back with in full force on the roads. And mm -hmm. uh, in India, it is uh, too much of a status symbol to have a car. Uh, Same here, yeah. And one reason which I find here is a lack of proper public transport system. And I think that is one thing just to reduce the number of cars. That, that could be one way, which, and many countries in the Western world I have found they are doing that. Their public transport system is very strong. So mm -hmm. instead of uh, 20, 20 cars flying, there could be one bus. Is that, yeah. that is one way of reducing it. As you said, more of walking and more of bicycle lanes because in uh, uh, India, it is so difficult also because that there are no lanes for cycles and things like that. But uh, mm -hmm. and when we talk of a new normal, I hope that new normal includes these things. Uh, but very rightly said, and we are aiming for what we call a feminist fossil fuel free future. So oh. that that is should, what our aim should be. And uh, yes. but you are very right at our own level. And India again, um, are the presenters pointed out that the river, the water uh, uh, of the river, and the rivers are very uh, very clean now. Because a lot yes. of rubbish yes. is dumped in India in the rivers, maybe because of religious ceremonies performed there. And so a lot of pollutants are added there. And because people are not coming out of, are not supposed to go there. So the river waters are clean. So yes. uh, there's a lot of religion involved there also in polluting uh, rivers, at least in our country. Mm -hmm. So that's very true. You've really pointed, the, the, you've hit the nail on the wall by your suggestions. <laughs> and Dr. Ramakant, what have you? We would like to hear you also on this topic about continue with a better environment. Yes, Dr. Ramakan, he's there. Yes, uh, Professor Ramakan. Okay, uh, uh, we'll uh, maybe we'll come back to him later on. And uh, okay, okay. Yes, no, yes, no. yes, 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 please, yes, yes. Hello, should I continue? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Can, please. I was just saying that uh, she has already covered that uh, very well. So mm -hmm. now I will uh, just try to add certain interesting thing that yes. uh, it was sometimes uh, very interesting to see that the mountain peaks were visible from 250 to 300 kilometers away, which were not seen even from those cities. Mm -hmm. Even uh, th this was something which because the pollution was almost gone at that time, air was clean mm -hmm. and uh, water was clean and the people were not on the road, so therefore it was very easy to go for morning walk or those things. It was much better because everything had come to stand still. Mm -hmm. But what is the better part of it is that I will say educated class and majority people have at least understood that to save themselves, they have to keep a distance, social distancing. They have to keep, put out their shoes outside the house or somewhere so that they don't go into the house and uh, that carries the infection. So that is also a practice which I've seen at many places started. We have also started. And uh, then the sanitizer well up that part and also hand washing, repeated hand washing. These things were not very practical in India, but they're started now. And uh, lucky part that our prime minister started those to toilets. So 
I have been visiting to villages. I find that people are conscious. They are putting out, you know, those uh, masks also, my devised masks, and uh, on the same time they are trying to clean those things. So this is uh, that way a good part. But there is a section which is not doing this. I know this is very difficult. But anyway, now what is happening is that for controlling these things, they are putting fines. If you don't put on a mask, then at some places the fine will be somewhere around 100 rupees. So therefore, what is happening is people are scared of that and therefore they will put on. And somehow the other, they will learn it. But I think gradually, it is educating a better health system to people to follow so that they don't fall ill. We have understood that not much treatment is available. The only thing available is your immunity. So diet pattern is also improving. People are shifting from non-vegetarian to vegetarian diets. And as very nicely revealed by you, a lot of people have gone for cycling. Even I see at uh, many places in, in morning walk, people go from, come from long distances and they keep on moving on cycle for kilometers and kilometers. Not only it is adding to their health systems, but at the same time, the pollution level is dropping and will not come back to the same which was there before. Yes, what we need is the cycle tracks, which should be nice and should be available and continuous, not interrupted. Then these things will be better. And the public transport system, you're very right that if that is there, then naturally people will not use the vehicle for creating traffic blocks. So I think uh, gradually we are learning with those things, gradually releasing, you know, that lockdown and at the same time stricter punishments and stricter rules coming up which are going to help everybody in uh, making their you know health and uh, health in a better for a protected person so therefore we are following all those things and gradually we are educating and trying to educate uneducated so that these things awareness programs are going on and uh, different, you know, NGOs are working in this direction. Government is trying to provide this. That, that if they are educated, the chances are the things will be controlled better. So I think they have already covered all these topics, and these were speakers who uh, they were also doing very well. And uh, it was a really good good experience to listen to them. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And we and move on to the next presentation and which is on uh, i think on transportation problems so okay, which has okay. been covered by the chairperson staff yes 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 sir yes sir Taj. Yes. So now I invite Lakshmi Narayan and Ram Karthike to speak on transportation its current problems and the future plans over to you guys to repeat that uh, this was totally done by these third year students and I'm sure many of them presented for the first time ever. And it was just on the, after listening to all the talks which we had arranged for them, uh, they came up uh, with this, these presentations, working from home uh, through uh, a long distance connection, they could not meet each other. So keeping that in mind, um, I would like uh, Dr. Ramakant and then Nenet also to please uh, give them some inspiring take home message uh, before we load the last presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. As I said before also, the presentation uh, is full of confidence and also the academic material. The only thing I'll say that uh, even best can be better. So therefore mm -hmm. you keep on uh, having having um, you know slide which, which which may have less lines the important thing what we have been seeing that if you put several lines in a slide it looks like a newspaper so the art is maybe that if i get a chance i'll show you that slides should have only few important things and uh, try to highlight them so that is one thing which i'll definitely make comment to in future whenever you present it may be slides number may be more but on the same time, one slide should not contain more than six, five, six, nine, seven, nine. Then you'll find that they are more readable. As uh, you find that if you speak less, you are more audible, you're more heard. Similarly, if your slides are having less lines, then you'll find it will be a better presentation. It's still better. And uh, on the same time, what I feel that uh, there is uh, nothing like, a, there's no, no end. And you, in your branches, whatever, possibly you are all management students, if I'm not wrong, then always look and dream for the best. 
I will give that advice to you. Never see, see a small dream. Be the biggest dreamer. And I tell you, and I promise that you will remember me. If you are the biggest dreamer and you have passion and that instinct, killing instinct, that unless the dream means not those things which you have seen in, in sleeping, I will say that dreams are those which will not let you sleep. And once you have those ideas and you know points before you, remember one or two sentences which I'd like to definitely say that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So therefore, you should have a plan. You should have a target. You should have some objective. What we are going to do? What are you going to achieve in your life? And that should be absolutely calibrated that I'm going to do this, this, this at that time. And the final achievement, which is in your mind, should never be curtailed. Always be behind it unless you achieve. That is one. Next is if you don't prepare, if you fail to prepare, then you prepare to fail. So therefore, preparation should be there. As you have already done your presentations, you must have prepared, you must have read about it, you, you are everywhere taught, and then you made them slide. So always remember, a target should be made. You should always aim and never try to see a small dream. Always see the biggest dream you can dare, and then you will find that this can be completed. And uh, as you've already seen it, then try to spread the knowledge. Don't keep it up to yourself. And if you spread the knowledge, you learn more and more. You become more confident. As a teacher, I have been observing when those teachers who take plenty of classes, they become a better teacher. And those who don't take it, they cannot become better teacher because the students will make them better. They ask questions, they pose difficulties, and that's how we become sharper. They ask the latest you know, advancement, which we have to read and keep updated. Even today, when I'm talking on academic webinar, they're asking questions which are published in a few months you know, in journal. So we have to read and update it. So remain updated and have be the biggest streamer. I'll just say that and always look you for, for the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Nenit, can we have a message from you? Yeah. Um, I am very much impressed with this uh, uh, young, young group of presenters. They have a very much diverse topics. And I agree with Dr. Ramakant that when they do presentations, the PowerPoint should have limited words written on it, and they just they just have to expound on it. And then if they do that, the audience or the listeners will be more encouraged to listen to them than looking at the PowerPoint and reading on it. And having said that, um, this group of young presenters uh, will be the great leaders in the community later on. Why did I say that? Because they are able to re reflect on the different issues that are currently affecting humanity and their topics are actually related to the existing SDG 17. And then at the same time, um, they can already start doing mentoring on the next layer of um, youngsters in India with similar or, or people of similar thinking and like-minded people. And then at the same time, learning from you Shoba and they learning from Dr. Ramakant as well, they are already starting to internalize development work and looking at the different areas affecting humanity, affecting health, affecting social life, and uh, trying to do some scientific researches and then having some um, basis to provide conclusions or to give conclusions as a basis therefore later on for uh, developing policies, or developing guidelines that would improve on health system, that improve on with the way how the government or the schools are responding to current problems and emerging problems. So um, with that, what I can say is that continue doing the work and they need to pass the baton to the next layer of students and researchers in the future. And ultimately doing that, um, they will have a sense of history with the kind of problems that India is facing right now 
and how it was dealt with by the different multi-sectoral partners. And from there, they can work on it and at the same time, um, put all things into a very good perspective and continue to help the country build a better world for the next generation. And with that, uh, hopefully, they will be able to help mold the children and the youth in the coming uh, generation. So that is what I'm trying to see in this group of presenters, very young, very young doctors or very young scientists or very young students that would be able to help in the, in the uh, development of the community and the country as a whole. Thank you to all of you. You have very nice uh, presentation. Content-wise, it is very rich. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, thank you very much. And we are still a little bit start opening, but we are trying. So just bear with us for a little while if we can manage it. And uh, we are asking them because some of them had sent a recorded presentation because of poor internet connection at there. And even my internet is very, very weak at the moment. So uh, just bear with us for a little while and let us try if we can just uh, open their presentation and show it to you. Just for a little while, please. Welcome to CNS. Okay, I, I'll share my screen and perhaps it is opening here. So I hope you are able to see it. So I will just share the screen and uh, then uh, we can see perhaps. In this, in this yeah. presentation, I can you all see my screen? Are here to present on the topic. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we can't. No, then, then it's, it's not working here. There either it started off. So, um, uh, let uh, me see if Bobby can try it again. Can Lakshmi Narayan, can you share your screen? Uh, play it and just share your screen. Is it possible? Uh, till we get the issue resolved, I would uh, like to wish Shobha a very happy birthday. Uh, oh, thank you very so, much. And, yeah. and a very happy birthday to Dr. Ramakant as well. Yes, Dr. Ramakant as well. Yes. Shobha. I also, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. That yes. Right so we, we are still waiting. I hope it, uh, it works. Let's see. Because if Lakshmi Narayan can share his screen and play at his end, the video. Can you do that, Lakshmi Narayan? You or your partner can be can share your screen. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, maybe I can share the screen and uh, view the show the video. So I'll share the screen. So you have got the video with you, is it? Yes, ma'am. I, I just got it now. Okay, great, great, great. 
just just let me know if you can uh, yes. see the yes you can okay are you Why able not? to hear yes we were able to hear just now yes okay okay yes yes we can see it great We, we can't hear it uh, we can't hear we can see the screen but we can't hear vision of the transport sector has become a major significant user of natural energy by natural energy i mean yes, now we can in, in other fossil fuels as a matter of fact it is observed that 30% of greenhouse gases emitted is from the transportation sector so what exactly is the problem in transportation well the problem lies in two broad categories so first is high density of number of individual vehicles and the second is inefficiency in combustion of fuels in the vehicles let's start with high density of number of vehicles so Roughly 16% of vehicles in our country belongs to the top five cities. And here you can see some data points with taking Delhi as an example. India has become a huge market and target for automobile companies. This graph would explain you the different vehicle density in our country. One main thing you should see in the graph is a plot which show buses. Buses are a mode of public transport. You can see that they are very negligible in the entire graph across years. This shows how bad our public transportation system is. Another point that you must note in this graph is that you must see the number of vehicles increasing over time. The increased vehicles also mean that individual customers who have access or individual customers who are a customer to oil companies. The other environmental impacts of transport system include traffic congestion and automobile-oriented urban sprawl, which can consume natural habitat and agricultural land. By reducing transportation emission globally, it is predicted that there will be significant positive effects on Earth's air quality, acid rain, smog, and climate change. Now let's talk about inefficiency in fuel combustion in automobiles. Inefficiency is a large factor of pollution. In India, fuel adulteration is a major problem. Adulterated fuel, when used in automobiles, leads to incomplete combustion, and incomplete combustion produces toxic gases like oxides of carbon and sulfur, which are very, which are not very good. One latest trend that we must all keep a note of is the role of e-commerce. Large retail corporations in the most recent years have focused their attention to e-commerce spending. As a result, many industries compete to get products and services in the hands of their consumers. In order to beat out competition, many of these corporations created incentives to make customers buy from their online store instead of another. The most popular incentive among customers turned to be either free, fast or one-day shipping. With these shipping options, getting get products and services to the hands of buyers at unbelievably fast rates than ever before, there are negative externalities of public roads to climate change. E-commerce business incentivizes to implement fast, free, one-day shipping because these programs almost always come with a membership program that consumers need to buy into in order to receive the benefit of no shipping charge. For large stores with large online presence, they can have millions of customers opting for these shipping benefits. As a result, they are unintentionally increasing carbon emissions from not consolidating their purchases.
So with all these, we must ask a question. Are people ready to travel in an eco-friendly way? The answer is yes. People are, people are ready and they really want to travel in an eco-friendly manner. Now my friend would take over and explain you the alternatives. Hello there. I am Lakshmi Narayan. I am going to continue the rest of the presentation. So we are going to talk about the future of the topic. One expert said that the future of the transportation is shared, electric and automated. The shared mobility ecosystem continues to grow and includes an array of services such as car sharing, micro transit, for hire services and shared micro mobility. The convergence of shared mobility, electrification and automation is predicted to have a transformative effect on goods, access and mobility. Over the next 20 years, level 5 fully automated vehicles will be increasingly deployed in the marketplace, making these services more cost effective, efficient and convenient than human driven privately owned vehicles. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have watched the Blade Runner movie? Me neither. So apparently it has all these flying cars and stuff. Okay, let's not just talk about it and then go into the topic. So, what should be our first priority in the upcoming days? There are three things that we should focus on. We'll go through them one by one. First is the decarbonization of the earth. Second is the managing transport and demand. And the last one is sustainable transportation. So, the question is, how are we going to decarbonize the earth? There are four levels for this. First is shifting our focus to nuclear energy, which is safe and secure. Nuclear, nuclear energy can work, but 50 years of debating about it have passed and we still haven't agreed on the best way to deal with proliferation and waste issues. It's not too cheap to meet. In fact, it's likely more expensive than renewables if you fully account for dealing with associated waste and security. Next step is using renewable energy in the future. There is enough wind in the world to supply the entire world's needs. Solar, excess, solar supply excess exceeds even that by many times and is far by the largest renewable resource. In reality, wind is a second order effect of solar energy anyway. The sun differentially heats the oceans, atmosphere and land and these thermal differences create the wind. The wind in turn makes waves while there is in fact a lot of energy in the waves in the deep ocean, there is very little nearer to the shore. Even if we capture all of the waves hitting every coastline on the planet, that's not enough to meet humanity's demand for energy. The ocean is a fragile ecosystem and the capturing large portions of the wave energy would ne negatively affect the oxygenation of the oceans, among other effects. Next, we go to carbon tax. So what is carbon tax? Carbon tax is a tax levied on carbon content of fuels, generally in transport and in energy sector. Carbon taxes are a form of carbon pricing. By the time we have the political will to implement a carbon tax, renewables will probably be already cheaper than fossil fuels. A high enough carbon tax would make all of us, all of the fossil fuels more expensive than at least some of the other solutions. And then a perfectly rational market would use these solutions. That's probably true-ish, but who ensures the tax is high? Who does the tax goes back to? The government? Refunded the people? How is it collected at what point? The question still remains. It is difficult to say the idea of carbon tax is bad. It isn't. It is much more difficult to know what exactly to implement and how to implement. It is probably just as effective to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies in which how many market could tip the scales in favor of alternate today. As mentioned previously, by the time we have political will to implement carbon tax, renewables will be probably already cheaper than the fossil fuels. Next, in order to mitigate the services adverse impact of current transportation systems, strategies can be devised to manage transport demand for passengers and flights as well as to redistribute this demand in space or in time. Profitable, affordable and unsubsidized transportation is a good indicator of its sustainability. Increasing transport costs and the pressure to subsidize them can be interpreted as signals that they may be unsustainable. There are several interrelated ways in which transportation case system can be adapted to cope up with transportation demand and reach a better level of sustainability. First is full cost prices. 
the full or partial recovery of costs related to public investments incurred in relation to constructing maintaining and operating transport networks they remove artificial signals such as subsidies and let users assume the real cost of transportation which include road pricing and pollution taxes and fees motorists are charged for floating fee which is dependent on the variability of demand in peak and off peak hours for using targeted roads this can be implemented through a variety of techniques such as tolls or licensing fees tax and pollution fees would solve the implementation of increased tax on vehicle and fuel purchasing as well as imposing fees on vehicle owners who operate at low levels of energy sufficiency the rationale of such an approach is to provide incentive to influence users towards mobility of choices that are more sub- sustainable next is the parking controls by raising parking prices or reduction in the amount of parking vehicle space such as such strategy can be used to deter the private owned vehicles in areas of highest demand and raising the price of commuting by car to high density areas the expected result is to encourage commuters to seek other alternatives either in mass transit ride sharing or car pooling for freight distribution they tend to be ineffective since delivery trucks will influence regulations for dur- short duration deliveries next is trip up avoidance a more direct method of reducing traffic demand by avoiding trips is a complex endeavor since it involves strategies where an activity still takes place while related mobility is mitigated this is mostly related to the use of information technologies which paradoxically can at the same time substitute for and support mobility for instance e-commerce can reduce the number of shopping trips but this involves a level of substitution substitution to parcel deliveries next is traffic bans though traffic bans the regulatory institution would exert direct control over the allowable limit of vehicles in a given urban area or along specific corridors depending on the measures of transport supply demand functions arbitrary es- estimates of carry capacity many high density central leaps areas have closed streets to pedestrian use to create public spaces more conducive to commercial and social activities next we come to the sustainable transportation and how it can be done first is car sharing recent advances in car sharing technologies and the potential for self driving vehicles underline a much more sustainable usage of car assets that could remove up to 90% of the vehicles from the streets this adds up to be this adds up to the ongoing technological improvement in the engine and drive technology which has reduced vehicle emissions next is automobile independence it is a situation that is often related to an unsustainable urban environment however such an observation is at odds with the mobility choice and preferences of the global, global population where the automobile is rapidly adopted when income levels reach a certain threshold next is variety costs variety of costs in transport operations that must be built in order to price of a price of providing transport facilities and services environmental sustainability represents a growing area of responsibility for the providers of transport services inciting them to acquire expertise in environmental management the most important challenge is to implement environmentally sustainable transport within competitive market structures leaning on coping with changes in transport demand while improving transport supply self driving vehicles is as we all know that a new tesla cyber truck is the trend nowadays people are slowly but progressively moving towards electric vehicles it will take another decade to completely move out of fossil fuel powered vehicles and now we come to the plans for the future so what we have first is the self driving cars we already know that we are quite there yet but not at the extreme end of it right now we are at level 4 of automated vehicles that means that we still need a human being behind a wheel for emergency situations level 5 is where you have to, don't have to worry about the manuals and steering wheels it will just be an other nap you take in your car next is hyperloop hyperloop is a proposed mode of passenger and freight transportation first used to describe an open source back train used released by joint team from tesla and spacex hyperloop is a sealed tube or system of tubes which low air pressure through which a pod may be traveled substantially free of air resistance or friction the hyperloop would convey people or objects at airline or hypersonic speeds while being at very energy difference 
This would drastically reduce travel time versus trains as well as planes over distances of under approximately 1500 kilometers. Next, we come to straddling bus. Straddling bus is where a transit elevated bus was proposed where a guided bus tra straddles about traffic. As you can see the picture that how it can move over the other vehicles and making the behind making the vehicles behind them sad. This concept is still developing today and it's already operating in Brazil and four other cities in China. But it was scraped due to some unforeseen circumstances. Flying cars. Remember the flying class I told you about? Well, flying cars is a personal air vehicle that can provide transportation by both air and ground. Many prototypes are built since the 20th century using many flight technologies. In 2021, PALV, Liberty Roadable Aircraft, will become the first flying car in full production. So let's hope for the future and make this transportation efficient and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lakshmi Narayan and Ram. Uh, a very good peep into the future. But I think the bottom line is that we need to reduce the number of vehicles on the road. And uh, as has been said also by our chairpersons, uh, I think there is, uh, in fact, there is no need for question and answers. We have not got any questions today because the chairpersons were so, so very, very precise and so very explicit in, in explaining whatever uh, was needed or whatever was uh, lacking or whatever more information we had. So they have covered the question and answer session already, I think. So um, uh, over to Sartaj now. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank our chairs to, for today, Miss um, Nenet and uh, Dr. Samak for giving us insightful uh, comments for the speakers. And I would also like to uh, thank the speakers for us who were my uh, my uh, colleagues from uh, And uh, in uh, this will, uh, in these SDG talks, we have had 82 speakers from over 15 countries and more than a combined 50 hours of discussion, which is truly substantial. So I would again like to thank all the speakers and chairs for today, and as well as Shobha Ma'am and Bobby sir for giving us this opportunity to intern and have a whole new experience. Thank you. And once again, special thanks to Dr. Ramakant and Nenet for bearing with us, staying with us, and uh, uh, while we were trying to overcome the technical glitches which were there. So. Uh, that that is the patient patience you showed in times of a crisis and that is what we are facing today a crisis situation so please stay safe stay healthy and cns family once a family always a family this is what i had told the interns and uh, dr ramakan then it we, they are already part of the cns family and we have now we have added 36 more members uh, to our family and we will remain connected, COVID or no COVID, internship yes. or no internship. I, I hope we get the message across and thank each, I thank each one of you. Uh, and I accept my birthday wishes. Many of them are thank, <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you very much. their wishes to me and, and also Dr. Ramakant. We used to celebrate our birthdays together. Often we have <laughs> celebrated it together, but these are difficult times. So thank you very much for being with us today, Nenet and Dr. Ramakant. It was really thank inspiring you. to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Thank Bye. you, ma'am. Yes, good night in Philippines. Yes, good night. <laughs> Sorry, Nenet took too much of your time today. It's okay with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.